Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, along with Sarah. Hello! And we want to thank everyone for their patience. We had a little technical difficulty. I don't know what happened, but it started working, so we're just going to keep our fingers crossed because that's all I can do because I'm not a technical person, so... <sighs> well, Jason's here anyway, so I guess if, if something... <laughs> maybe he can fix it if something goes terribly wrong, but... No, he's shaking his head no. So, you know, we're just going to do our best, guys. Um, this video is brought to you by jerrysautorama.com. I'm using the Lucas uh, 1862 watercolors. You, of course, can use whatever you want. And I have a supply list as well as a pattern and reference photo on my blog and linked up in the video description. All right. It's been a couple weeks. Anything to add? Uh, no, good. All right. Well, and we're back downstairs, so hopefully you'll be able to hear both of us better because we're on either side of the microphone now instead of me being next to the microphone and Sarah being on the other side of the room. So that should work. Um, I'm working on watercolor paper. Oh, if you guys have any questions, uh, please type the word question in all caps and then um, you can go ahead and write your question in normal letters and uh, I feel so out of sorts. And somebody will help you. Either I'll help you, Sarah will help you, a moderator will help you. We're just doing our best here today. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any anything to add? To nope. Still good. <laughs> okay. Let's just get to painting. Yes. It'll help soothe. It'll help soothe the edges. Soothe the stress. Okay. I'm just gonna start by splashing some water on. We're gonna do a loose style here, and I am going to go ahead and wet some of the jar. Basically, I just want to have. Um, I want to have some areas wet so my paint will flow, but I also want to have some kind of like happy uh, accidents happening happening where it will hit kind of water outside of the area we're painting. I'm going to start off with some cobalt teal and I didn't clean my palette off from when I was doing my um, my practice piece because I thought it might be kind of fun to just kind of use up that paint and you know have some interesting stuff happen. You can really use whatever you want. Use the brushes you like. This is a number 30 Creative Mark Mimic. It's part of the value set. Um, and I do recommend that set if you are looking to get those brushes because it is a lot better, a better deal than buying them individually. Um, I'm also really loving the uh, Royal and Line Nickel Menta brushes lately. They're brand new though and they're kind of hard to find so I, I wanted to make sure I used something that, that you could get easily today. Um, and then after you put any color on your canvas, you can go ahead and you can splatter some of that color. And that will just give you a liveliness into the background. I did put a little bit of synthetic oxygal in my clean water. And um, I had it from a marbleizing kit, so I figured why not? I'm going to give it a try. Um, and that will help your color flow if you have a paint that's not as flowy. And I haven't used my Lucas paints in a while, but I seem to recall them not being super duper flowy. So I am going to just grab some, uh, it's actually, oh, Genuine Rose PV19. Any of your PV19 um, pinks will work well for this. And I, I swatched out my colors as they were in the palette. I find that really helpful when you've got a big set like this to keep track of what, you, what you're using. And we're going to be using some salt, and I did put that in the... Um, materials list below, so just make sure you have some handy. That's going to give us some of the texture on these multi-headed flowers. I have a, um, I have a bit of a challenge when I'm working with multi-headed flowers. I like to, I, I enjoy painting flowers with a lot of big petals so I can get in there and, you know, have a lot of room to play. So I find myself kind of, I don't know what to do when I have all these little petals. I get overwhel overwhelmed and then it just looks like a big um, it either looks too detailed or it looks too mushy. So I'm going to let the salt do a bunch of my work today and they'll make those little kind of star shaped flowers. So after you have the light wash in there, take your brush. You can actually switch to a smaller brush if you want to so you don't get too much water. Kind of like scrape off the, the excess and then go right to the pan and then add some more pigmented color in there. And while that's still wet, you can go ahead and drop in some salt. And I like to use like a kosher salt or a sea salt because it's a little bit more um, coarse and ununiform. So you get like a little bit more um, deliberate texture. And now I'm going to go in and do the purple ones. And I'm going to use a mixture of cobalt, uh, cobalt blue and oxazine violet. 
And that color does have a little bit of a milkiness to it, so um, you want to have it fairly watery so it will be transparent. Don't worry if it uh, mushes into some of your other flowers there. It has a beautiful granulation to it um, from the cobalt. Actually, I'm going to go in with my bigger brush so it's a little bit looser. Um, Jerry's RM has their, today's last day of their 50th anniversary sale, so if you did have your eye on some products from them, I would check it out um, today just to see if they're on a they're on a good sale. I know all the Lucas paints are on super sale, which means you can't use a coupon, but the prices are better than they would be if you took the regular price and added a coupon to it. So, um, so I did notice these paints were on sale. If you if you're in need of something, I would definitely go check them out. Uh, D Whitmore, you use teal or turquoise quite often. Can you mix them from other colors? You can if you have like phthalo blue. You can do phthalo blue and a little bit of um, phthalo green or viridian hue, and that will give you a really nice. Um, that'll give you a really nice, uh, kind of like a teal color. You might have to add a lot of water to it. Um, when you are using a single pigment like cobalt teal, you do get um, a certain vibrancy. It's a little bit different than if you mixed it, because once you when you mix, you kind of take down some of the vibrancy. But um, but definitely go ahead and mix it. I noticed like like the Yarka paints, you can mix really good teals with their basic colors. And any clean, strong art like artist watercolor should mix a good a good color. I think I have an extra bunch of flowers in this one than I did on my first one. That's okay. That's okay. More That's flowers okay. is good. This stage of the game, we got any flowers, we're doing good. Yeah. I did it uh, 10 minutes ago, I was like, oh, I don't know, this this might not happen. We might be having a two week break. It's putting in some stronger uh, dioxazine violet on its own. That is a really strong color, so, you know, just be aware of that. The key when you're doing a looser style is to show off the beauty of the paint and the paper. And use an economy of brush strokes because your water is going to be doing so much of the work. And we're going to go back in with our salt. And I prefer to keep it like open in a jar and pinch it out versus just shaking it on with a salt shaker. So if you have a salt, if your salt's in a shaker, just put it into your hand first and then pinch it. The wetter your paper is when you add your salt, the bigger crystallization you're going to get. And the wet, the drier it is, the smaller crystallization you're going to get. If I show you, um, Let's see, mine had dried up quite a bit, so you can see my crystallization is kind of small there. Um, try to find a couple bigger, like there's a nice big one right there. It's almost like a bloom. And I want those bigger ones because I want to have it represent those individual um, flower blooms. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to grab some burnt umber. Oh, did we have any questions? Uh, well, yes. Annette Nelson, does the salt melt? No, it does not dissolve. When it's dry, you're going to brush it off. So while that's drying, you don't, and I don't like to use a hair dryer or a heat tool because a hair dryer can, can blow the salt. You don't want it to move. You want it to stay still. And, um, and if you dry it too fast, you're going to lose a lot of that effect. So if you can let it dry for the most part on its own, you can heat it up towards the end. You're going to get a much better result. Uh, so I'm going to start off with some burnt sienna. I'm going to grab a little bit of yellow ochre. I love the Lucas yellow ochre. It's a real clean yellow ochre. I think they might use a synthetic pigment instead of the, um, I can take a look, PY42, so I think that one's a synthetic, I think PY43 is an iron pigment. It's just such a nice clean color that I didn't feel like I even needed to, to get like a bright yellow for flower centers or anything. So that's what I'm using here. If you prefer an earthy or yellow ochre, then I wouldn't suggest this one. Now the vase is wet and if those colors bleed together, that is totally fine. completely spaced. Did I answer her question? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Breathe, Lindsay. It's okay. It's going fine. It's all right. It's like when you're driving and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't remember driving here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I 
happens to everybody, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm going to grab a little bit of sap green. And I'm going to add a little verde into that because their sap green is really, really bright. And I think I will add a little bit of burnt umber to that because it's tone it down a little bit, desaturate it. And I am going to put in uh, a little bit of green here and there. I don't want to do too much because everything is still pretty wet. Kind of putting in some of the shadows. The hyacinth, those little grasses, they're more rounded at the end, but I do like to have some spiky um, shapes for contrast. I'm just kind of keep that in mind. They do have a rounded, rounded top to them. They're kind of like a thick, like a bulby leaf. Uh, Leah G, do you know Wand Brilliant by Holbin? It's sitting in my palette and I don't know how to use it. That's a tough color. I do have that. I think I have the whole bind and another version of it, and I don't really use it that much. It's almost like, um, it's almost like, like those old, uh, flesh tint colored crayons, you know, just that kind of like apricot um, Barbie skin tone color. It's, um, it's an odd one. I haven't found a really good use for it. Uh, so if anybody has any, any, uh, ideas for that color, please let us know in chat because I'm sure some people use it because they make it. It's got so much white in it too that, um, that I don't find it as useful for watercolor. Maybe if I was painting like a peach or something. Now, if you have puddles and you can see some blooms forming, you can soak them up if you don't want that effect. But if you do want the, that effect, then you can leave them be. I think I would like to take some of those colors that I'd used on the flowers and flick them in as well. kind of afraid that this puddle there might be too wet to get the salt effect, so I'm going to soak up a little bit of that. And maybe add a little bit more salt in it. I think it might have made my salt wash away. And you'll get a stronger effect if you have more, if the, if the area is wetter. I think I'll blot out some uh, highlights on the jar. Otherwise, this is going to take quite a while to dry. Everything is pretty juicy here. I feel like I might want to give the jar a little bit of that cobalt color, the cobalt teal, just soft greenish color. I'm going to try to blot off some of the areas on the leaves up here where they're, um, so I can go in and start to paint in there a little bit without disturbing my salt area. Lisa Foster, are the Princeton Select Value sets good for watercoloring? Um, I've used some of their snap brushes and they, the, the synthetic ones, I haven't used any natural hair ones. But their synthetic ones are good in the snap line, and that's a value priced line. I'm not sure about the specific value line you're talking about, but Princeton makes a good brush. They're, I don't think they would put out much that wasn't very good, so I would trust it. I am going to take some yellow ochre here, and I am going to grab a little bit of Viridian. That's making a nice uh, earthy olive green color. And I'm just going to put in these kind of highlighter areas 
I'm going to try to avoid the flowers if I can. If some gets in there, I'm not going to worry about it too much. But I just want to get some sort of color down. more colors than we typically use but I find that I do that more when I'm doing like a looser painting I'll tend to use a lot more colors than I would if I was doing a more realistic painting I think it's fun because you're, you're doing less to the painting so you can kind of let the colors steal the show and I'm just kind of I'm trying to like get up as close to the flowers as I can without bleeding into them in a few minutes I'll be able to speed along the drying, but I didn't want to rush it. I'm going to mix up some gray. I'm going to use some burnt umber and some ultramarine blue. And I'm going to add some of that onto the tabletop area here. I wasn't happy with the way the blooms formed, so... I'm just going to kind of go over them. I'm going to grab a little yellow ochre and put some background, a little bit of background in, not a lot, but I feel like I do want something to kind of help the purples really stand out. I'm going to wet this with the clear water that has a little ox gall in it just to help things flow. And if you hit it into anything, it will flow out and be kind of pretty, which I want to encourage that as well. You can tip your picture a little bit. Be careful of your salt because you don't want to, you don't want that to move around too much. And remember, things will shift a little bit lighter as it dries. Not too much when you're working with an artist paint, but it still can have a little bit of a shift. Now, the Lucas paints are um, quite a bit cheaper than their counterparts. So if you were looking to upgrade from a student grade paint to an artist grade paint, it is a nice, um, it is a nice one because you can upgrade without it being too expensive. I don't think they're quite the same quality as some other artist grade paints, but they're certainly not bad. I'd call them almost a mid mid range, and I'm kind of just playing with colors in the background, waiting for stuff to dry. You just kind of gotta go with your gut on these types of pictures. Just paint what you feel you want. Uh, Cookie Monster, are Pentel Aquishes as good as normal brushes? I think they meant aqua brushes. Yeah, probably, I think they're called the Aquash, too. The, that's like the name of their water brushes. Um, it's completely personal preference whether you like to use the aqua, the water brushes or not. I like to use them for travel. I don't use them in my studio very much because I prefer to have a bucket of water to, to go from. Um, but, you know, they're, you know they're, they're a pretty comparable water brush to other brushes out there. I haven't used those very much. I do have a couple, um, and they work just fine. I haven't had any issues with them. Oh, I like that much better with the background in it, but if you don't like the background, you don't have to do that. Um, I think I'm going to play around a little bit while the flowers are still wet, because they're still sopping wet, I think, because we're painting in the basement. Um, so it's just a little more damp down here, so things don't dry as quickly as they did upstairs with the, you know, my desk connects to the heater. So I'm going to take advantage of that and add some kind of um oh and this would be a good place if you want to play with a specialty brush like um let's try this right here this like a liner or a dagger um this is really great when you're doing loose painting especially if you have a hard time like loosening up because you're going to end up with very calligraphy like uh looser strokes 
just because the bristles are going to want to flip flop around on you. This is a Princeton Neptune quarter inch dagger. They come in uh, larger sizes as well, but I don't find those to be as useful as the quarter inch one because that's kind of big even for a lot of the stuff you're going to be doing, unless you're like pinstriping a car or something. And I wouldn't recommend this type of brush for that. You'd want to synthetic, but they hold a lot of um, a lot of paint. If I soak this up, if I soak up a bunch of paint and water, I'll be able to paint for miles with it. So it's a really fun, really fun brush to have for like trees and grasses and shrubs because it gives you that randomness that you have in nature that's kind of difficult to um, to create when you're trying to do it on purpose. For my dark on the purples, I'm using ultramarine blue, dioxazine violet, and I am going to grab uh, some of that cobalt teal again. Uh, Stacy Brister, she has uh, Arches Green Block, Strathmore 500 Series, 100% Cotton, or Canson XL Watercolor. Which one should she start with? Well, I think I would use the Arches when you when you really want to do when you really want to put the time in because that's the nicest paper out of all of those. And um, the Canson I would use for practice and just fun stuff that you just want to play with or you're doing some rubber stamping or something where you're not going to, um, you're not going to, you don't want to worry about it too much. And um, the Strathmore 500 is a decent paper too. Um, I haven't used that one very much, but that would be um, probably in between like the, uh, the Canson and the Arches. It should be a professional range. It should be cotton if it's the 500 series. I've used a Strathmore 400 and I like that a lot and that's uh, cellulose still. Alright, now I just, I really need to dry this before I can do anything else because everything is just too, um, too fluid and movable. I'm going to just hit the edges with my paper towel because otherwise I'm going to get some back washes that I don't want there. If you do want the back washes and you leave the puddles, but I don't want them there at the edge, so I'm just blotting them gently. And while I'm drying this with a heat tool, if you have any questions, then go ahead and put them in the chat. Try to keep it watercolor related and uh, we'll help you out. Cookie Monster, if you could only have one brush, which one would it be? Oh, if I could only have one brush, it would either be a number eight and a number 12, so either an eight, a 10, or 12 round, and it would be a synthetic squirrel, such as a Royal Lang Nickel Minta, a Creative Mark Mimic, which is this guy right here, or um, a Princeton Neptune, one of those synthetic squirrels. That I could do more with that brush than, than any, any probably five brushes put together. But you don't need all of them, just pick a brand, whatever is easy for you to find where you live, and, uh, and it will be great. Uh, Penny Cormier, is ultramarine or any other paints too acidic for Oxgall? I don't think so. Um, your paints sh really shouldn't be acidic. They're um, either, they're inorganic, they're either synthetic or like a mineral generally, unless they're a, a uh, organic dye color, but they should all be fine with Oxgall. Most paints contain Oxgall. And most of your art supplies are going to be pH neutral anyway for longevity and archival, archival purposes. What is your opinion on the Ganzai Tambi watercolors? The Ganzai Tambi watercolors are great for art journaling and scrapbooking. Anytime you're going to be using a paper that's not as heavily sized or as high quality, because um, of the type of paint it is in Eastern watercolor, it's got a, it's almost got like an internal sizing. It's got a binder in there that will make the paint sit on top of the paper, so it'll look good even on um, less quality papers or less sized papers such as rice paper.
Sorry about how long this is taking to dry, guys. This thing was soaking wet. Oxgall do? Oxgall reduces the surface tension in your water, allowing the paints and the water to move more. Okay, so now I'm going to take a clean, dry paper towel and I'm going to brush off the salt. And I didn't get as um, drastic of, a, of an effect as I had hoped, but it still giving, gave me some nice texture and will enhance our little flowers. Your paper should feel smooth when all the salt is removed, so you want to make sure you get all of that off of there. Sometimes you got to go in with your fingernail and it'll want to stick. Look how big that piece of salt is. See, that? I that's what I like about the kosher salt is the uneven granules. Oxgall has an effect on the salt, on the salt, on how the salt interacts. So I definitely didn't get as big of crystals as I usually get. That's all right. I like this white sparkle in here. Um, you can always go in there with a wash of yellow if you want to make your colors, your purples pop a little bit more because that's opposite on the color wheel. I'm going to work on the um, the grasses now. Let me get my reference photo. I've got like, we got three computers making this live stream happen here today. <laughs> I got one with my reference photo on it, and Sarah's got one, and I got the streaming computer. Oh, I have the fancy new one. The yeah. New tablet computer. Yes, yes. I'll be doing a video soon on how to use technology to um, enhance your crafting and to make your crafting more affordable. So that'll be coming up in a week or so. So what I did here is I took the Viridian and the Burnt Umber and I made this beautiful, almost forest green color. And it's a very earthy color. And this will be a nice uh, color to put in our shadows um, on the edges of like our blades of grass and also kind of in between them. I am using the dagger just because I think it will give me um, an interesting line. Now when I get to an area like the water line here, the rim of the glass, I want to make sure I don't paint it like a smooth, perfect line because the light would be distorted as it hits those parts of the glass. So I want to make sure that that my uh, my painting represents that. And I'm also going to just kind of trace along the edge there of the top of the glass because you would get the, the colors, the surrounding colors refracted in there. I just want to kind of showcase that as well. If you're looking for a really um, highly controlled line, the dagger will not be your best bet just because it the long floppy bristles will want to bend and twist on you. But I think that kind of gives you a nice um, loose feel. It's a, it's a nice way to achieve that looseness in your watercolor if you have a hard time with it. Sometimes it's really hard to be random, especially if you're uh, someone who likes to do a lot of detail or likes to have a lot of control on their work. Sometimes it's hard to help it. I'm trying to keep some of those little white sparkly areas. crisp line on the sides of some of these blades and that will help uh, bring a little order to the top of the bouquet. Rachel Gephardt, is it normal for watercolor paper to warp when you're working or could this be a low grade paper issue? Most papers will warp. Even this block that's bound on all four sides was like warping a little bit with all the water I had on there. It's a pretty common occur occurrence. Um, some people stretch their paper. I used to do that a lot more. Um, especially if I'm working large, I'll do that, but for the for the most part, I'll just tape it down. But I do have a video on how to stretch it, which is where you soak your paper 
and then you um, lay it down on a like a piece of plywood and then you use gummed tape which is a paper tape that has adhesive that you activate by wetting it and uh, that will keep it like tight as a drum because you like stretch out the fibers so much and that is a dream to paint on but I rarely take the time to do that anymore but it is kind of a nice uh, a nice thing to know how to do now I'm going to start grabbing some of the sap green on its own for some highlighting you can see there the sap green from Lucas is almost like a spring green and I'm gonna go and just go right up against that area I just painted so that it will kind of bleed into that Jill Curran, sometimes my cheaper paper gets a spot that won't absorb paint. What should I do when that happens? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, could it be like moisture or oils on your hands? Because I know you said before to be careful with like hand lotion and yeah, touching paper. It or... could be that, yeah, but that could happen on any paper. It doesn't have to be, um, uh, be cheaper paper. If it was specifically happens to your cheap paper, but doesn't happen to any of your other papers, um, maybe even the paper was unevenly sized. I'm curious to know what brand of paper it is, and if it could be her, her hand lotion. If she has other papers to compare it to, or if that's the only paper she has and she just assumes that it's the paper and it could just be, be hand lotion. Yeah, good call. I wasn't even, wasn't even thinking about that. Well, I know you said before, like, you've caught yourself... Oh yeah, you know, putting hand lotion on, then taping or drying, yeah. and you know, you still got the the hand lotion on. Yeah, that's so frustrating when that happens, especially if you spend a lot of time on the drawing. Right. Basically, I want to alternate between my yellow ochre, the sap green, and the viridian, um, so that I get some interesting uh, variations of color. the pigments kind of do some of the work for us so that we're just she says it's the Strathmore 400 yeah yeah that shouldn't be um that sh that repel color um I would I would guess it's probably like a lotion or maybe I have had some of that paper though if I've kept it a long time um I've had it where if I do a really wet wash I'll see almost freckles on the paper like little dark gray spots but that's the only um, the only paper surface issue I've ever had with that paper. I think that's a great uh, paper to start with if you're just getting started and you you don't want to uh, spend the money on a higher grade of paper. I think it behaves very very well. Uh, Valerie is saying hers does the same thing. Really, and it's yeah. not a lotion issue, huh? Hmm. I wonder. I know Valerie lives in Arizona. So I'm wondering if climate might have something to do with it. Maybe, maybe it dries out the sizing or something. I'm taking a really watery wash of yellow ochre and I'm pulling color down into the roots of these bulbs. And we're going to grab some burnt umber real quick here in a second. And we're going to drip that in so that it, we can have some shadow in there. And then we're going to use a credit card scraper to um, to scrape the roots so we get those little uh, individual little roots in there. So you need this to be wet as you're going. So if your yellow ochre, watery wash of yellow ochre wasn't very wet, you'll want to make sure it is before you start to do the credit card scraper. Once you scrape, those lines are going to be permanent. So, you know, just make sure when you're scraping that you want to keep them there. And I prefer a cut a piece of credit card to, like if I'm trying to do these really fine lines, to the back end of the brush. But if you don't have a piece of cut up credit card handy, you can use the, um, the bevel end of your watercolor brush. A smaller brush will have a finer bevel end, which will be a little bit better for this. And you want to go with the um, with the sh with like the slicey part of the scraper if you want a fine line. If you go sideways, you might peel your paper. Like I got a little bit of residue of the paper to pull up when I just did that. So even on arches, so you want to go with the with the um, the skinny part of the 
the scraper. And I'm going to grab a smaller brush so I can put in just a little bit of more concentrated yellow ochre at the tips of the roots so I don't end up kind of wash over washing it, but I do want to add some of that in there. All right. If you want to lighten anything up, you can go ahead and blot with a paper towel and your lines will still remain. Because the, the roots are pretty light, but you did need some pigment on there in order to get them to soak up some color. There, that looks about the way I want it. Now I'm going to go back to, you can use a liner or a dagger, and I was having fun with that dagger, so I think that's what I'm going to use. And I am going to kind of go over in the flowers and do that same technique we were doing wet into wet, but this time I'm going to be doing it dry. I'll start with a pink. And like I mentioned before, this brush can hold quite a bit of paint and water, so you can, um, I was getting some bead water droplets off there so they didn't drip into my picture. So once you get that loaded, you can really go for quite a while. I'm thinking of every little stroke I put down as being a little petal, but I'm not, I'm not trying to paint every little flower in there. I'm just giving it the, the, um, kind of impression of those flowers. I like to have a few kind of stray ones poking out just to give it a little bit of looseness. Do you have any other questions? We're caught up for the moment. Awesome. How many people do we have today? We have 230. Wonderful. And only two thumbs down. Wow, that is something <laughs> right there. <laughs> I did a Facebook Live on Sunday um, on my Facebook well, page. Well, I saw after you had done it that you had done it. How did yeah, that go? It went really well. I'd never done one before, and um, Lava Soap had wanted me to do one on their Facebook page. I'm like, well, I'd rather practice with my peeps because they won't be judgy. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be base. helpful. Exactly. Give you constructive advice. Exactly. If what? necessary. And it was fun. It went really well, and uh, it was very easy. It was a lot more easy than YouTube. <laughs> like the little stress that we had before the show. I'm sure that happens too over on Facebook, but it was it was a lovely first uh, first experience over there. Good. Yeah, I was thinking I might do some like live Q and A over there, but I will definitely if I do anything like that, I'll put a replay on my blog so folks that aren't on Facebook can still watch it. You don't have to be. Like, you don't have to have a Facebook account or... Well, like, sometimes you just, like, you just don't... Like, I, I'm i notorious for just setting my phone down somewhere and leaving it there and doing uh -huh. stuff around the house. And, like, my friends, bless their souls, are so patient because they'll text me and I won't get back to them for, like, an hour. Oh, they all yeah. know it's because I just put my phone down, go off and do something else, and I just won't have my phone with me. And it's same, like, I just, like, I'll check Facebook once or twice a day if that, and unless I have something I'm keeping my eye out for. Yeah, I've always had really bad phone, like cell phone etiquette because we've always had a landline. So I figured if anybody really needs to get a hold of me, they're just going to call my right. landline. And but lately we've been getting so many like just scam calls and telemarketers yep. on the landline that I'm really considering getting rid of it because everybody in this house has a cell phone. So it's kind of foolish to keep it. Keep it so the every political party and survey company can call us. You can alternate your shades of purple, like have a mix that's got more ultramarine, one that's more teal, one that's more violet, and that will give you a little bit of an interest. Because I think when you've got a, like a spike or a ball of flowers, like when you have a multi-bloom flower or a multi-headed flower, it can be very easy for it to get kind of boring and samey. So by just alternating your colors, you can overcome that a little bit. There, but I think between the salt texture and just doing a little bit of, um, a little bit of shading, just a little bit of detail work with your brush like this, I think that's really all you need. 
And if you get a little too dense with your shading like I did there, just grab your paper towel and just blot it off and and you're good. Or if you get any any place you feel like you've got a little too much, you can just give it a little blot and that'll take care of it. I think I'm going to try a little yellow ochre. I want to just sneak in a little bit, um, a little shock of color here and there. So I think maybe just go into your sparkle area if you have any around your blooms and you can give it a, just a little bit of just a little bit of color. I don't want to overlap any purple though because then I'll get mud. I just want to give it a little bit of brightness. And sometimes you see like little concentrated little dots in the center of some of those blooms. Obviously we don't have all these painted really detailed, but you can go in with some yellow ochre because that is uh, color tends to be a little more opaque. And you can just add a few little dots. You might want to do that with a more controlled brush than the dagger, but just kind of a few little dots here and there to indicate where the centers of some of your flowers might be. Uh, Kurt Schwartz, when using gummed tape to stretch paper, will the tape peel off cleanly and give me a crisp edge, or do I need to use masking tape inside the gum tape for a crisp edge? You need to use masking tape inside the gum tape. I, in fact, I cut mine right off. I'll, um, after I'm done stretching it, I will go ahead and, um, like slice it off with a knife where the tape meets the paper because gum tape, gum tape is acidic. So I don't want any of that residue on my paper anyway. And then, um, if I want that white edge, which I usually don't care about cause I'll be matting it, then I would tape it off before I painted it. Like, like I'll go a half an inch within where I've, where I've stretched it. Now I'm going to grab a flat brush or an angle, doesn't really matter. And I had flicked on some yellow ochre. I'm just going to go ahead and brush some of that out. Any place where I feel like I might have a little bit too much. Just soften it a little bit. A lot of these techniques can seem a little arbitrary because you are just kind of adding a little bit and adjusting it and kind of puttering, but, um, but it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun just to kind of trust your in instincts and uh, rely on your instincts a little bit more than like a reference photo. I want to mix up a little more gray. I'm going to use again my burnt umber and my um, ultramarine blue. If it looks a little too brown, just add a little more blue until you get a nice uh, gray. And I'm going to use this flat brush to get some uh, some shadows on my vase. And here's where you can like kind of bring back the crispness of some edges if you've lost that. When you're when you are adding these refractions, you can keep the um, the lines nice and harsh because glass tends to have those harsher lines. Uh, D Whitmore, I tried stretching paper following your tutor tutorial, and my gummed tape came loose, so it didn't work. Any tips? Um, I find that once you've got like I, your your board the more you use your board that you're stretching on the better it will stretch you'll everyone will once in a while get up you know the paper will pop their their tape will pop off and you have to restretch it it's um it's pretty common it generally is because you've had too much water and you've washed the adhesive off of your tape um and it takes a little practice to kind of get the feel for what is um what's a good balance of moisture on your tape like sometimes I've had good luck where I don't even wet the tape, but I wet my paper so much that when I sponge it off and I just stick the dry tape down, there's enough moisture to um, grab the tape. And other times I just, I blot everything off almost dry and I wet the tape and I stick it down. So, you know, you just experiment. You'll find something that works good for you, but it, you know, it, it happens to everybody. You'll, you'll eventually, you'll once in a while have one of those, one of those um, tapes will just pop on you. On the table area, I'm going to add a little shadow and I am going to, actually I'm going to go with a bigger brush and I am going to just put half of it in with paint. So I'm wetting my brush, blotting it, and I am just going to stick 
the bristles on the side in my paint because I don't know how much of a shadow I want. And I'm just going to side load here and see if that gives me enough. Yeah, it's not really dark enough to show up, so I will have to go in um, with more color, but I wanted to go easy in case it was too much, so I'm going to have to remove it. Mixing up some more of that gray. This time I'm going darker, and I'm going to go right in and add it at the bottom of the vase on the table. And I'll go back to that brush and I'll drag it out. Let me see where I have my... I cleaned my brush off though because it got pretty. Alright, I think I'll stick with this brush a little bit and get some more darker shadows here and there. Oh, and we've got this little, um, I will grab a small brush for that. We've got the little metal part that, um, little wire part that goes around the jar to seal it. So we want to get that in there. paper is dry you can kind of rest your hand on your paper as you do that so that you don't um, have a wobbly edge and you don't have to connect all the lines just get a few lines in there so you can see kind of what you got but you don't need to you don't need to put every detail in you lose the looseness if you put all the details in and then while I have this color out in this small brush I am going to go in and add a few little details, um, like the water, just little here and there of some of the water line. I don't want to outline the whole thing or it will look very awkward. I'll put a little bit of uh, dark in the bottom of the vase. Quilt EA56, if I put too much gray in the jar for shadows, is there a way to get some of the blue water back? You can brush over it with water and blot it off, and you can take off some of the color that way. A lot of times I'll put the color in with one brush and I'll grab another brush, like a flat, to kind of smooth it out, soften it a bit. So don't panic if you get a little too much in there, you can usually soften it. And oftentimes I find that I need to go back and even add it a little bit darker. This is a fun picture for practicing with your different brushes, too. And it really not, there's not too much more I want to do to this. I'm going to be wrapping it up pretty soon here, guys. So get those questions in if you have some watercolor related questions for me. What do you think it needs, Sarah? Um, I think it looks good. I think if you fuss with it more, it's going to end up getting too much detail. Yes, probably and so. You're going to have to work on it more because it's going to be weird half detail. Yeah. Half <laughs> I feel it, like it, I it, need it, something. I feel like the little... Ah, uh, you do a little more splatter. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's or Maybe it. a couple of, like, petals on the table or yeah, something let's, like let's that. Yeah, let's do that. Or let's just glue some glitter to it somewhere. Let's get some sequins. There we go. <laughs> I like to splatter into a puddle. That's that's always fun. I like to dissolve the spatters too. I feel like I could use a little bit more hinting at the edge of the table there. over there and spatter some of that teal. I love that teal color. It granulates so prettily. 
Uh, these colors are available open stock and in sets. The sets can be a little pricey. Um, so if you want to try it or you like the particular color that I used, uh, I would definitely recommend you can get them in tubes, full pans or half pans, and they're very affordable compared to other other brands. I really love the Cobalt Teal. That would be a great one to, to try. Um, I'm trying to think of any colors I would avoid. Um, chromium Oxide Green, but I just like avoid that color. Anyway. <laughs> it's your favorite green ever. <laughs> I should force myself to do a painting using chrome oxide cream. You should. It would be good for you. Probably would be. Let me spatter a little bit of purple up there into that puddle. Okay, pull the box skull water in there. Yeah, I think I'm going to call this done. All right, any other questions or are we good? Let me see. I think we're caught up. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for hanging out today. I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, links to everything are in the video description. There's a pattern, reference photo, um, all that jazz, and Jerry's sale information. It's over tonight, though. Um, I mean, they always have great prices, but if there was something you had your eye on, um, that they have. They sell pretty much everything. You could go give it a look and, and see if they've got a good price or see if, you know, the price is good for you. Um, yeah, I probably ought to stop because I just can't. It's like, oh, <laughs> just, just going to be splatter. It's just going to be splatter, yeah. <laughs> It'd be a Jackson Pollock before we know it. Um, thank you so much for watching, guys. Until next time, happy crafting.